together. So today we are getting ready for project day again tomorrow. Um, we have lots to cover. Um, let me turn this camera around soon so that we can um, get started. So I'm finishing up, I'm going to turn this around. I'm finishing up looking at um, the faux encaustic, so we'll get that done today. So I'll show you how that's done. Um, we're going to go over, no, that's for that project. This is my piece from the other day. And as you can see, it has faux encaustic on it. And encaustic. There's a lot of glare from the camera, but you can see, let me see if I can get a better shot of it somewhere. It's soft and it looks like, um, like it's been waxed. And it's, it's, I guess it's hard to tell in this picture. Um, but if you could see it, up close you would see that it does actually look like full encaustic so that we're going to finish up from um, our project from the other day so I'm going to introduce tomorrow um, so we have lots to talk about so let me talk about full encaustic first and get this piece um, fixed so I'm going to turn this around to my little holder for now. It's not a perfect tripod. My tripod. Okay, I'm not sure why this tripod isn't wanting to hold today. There we go. All right, there we go. Perfect. So, um, hi everybody. If you're just joining us, we're going to start with the faux encaustic. So, um, what I did the other day was... Um, I covered this thing with a poured gloss varnish. So I don't know if you can see in the video, but it's super, super shiny and it's really dry now. But some areas, like up here, my, my um, walnut ink moved because it was water soluble. So all I'm going to do, because this is a water-based varnish, um, I'm able to go back in with my acrylic paints or my chalk paints or whatever I want and clean that up. So what I'm going to do is just in some areas where it looks a little dirty, I'm just going to go back in with a bit of um, paint. And I'm using a mixture here of chalk paint and acrylic, just whatever I have on hand. And it's just going to help me, um, like I said, brighten up some of those areas that got a little smudgy. Some, I'm not going to fuss around with the whole thing. Like it's, I'm not going to change everything. I am just going to um, fix up a few little spots. So um, Amelia had brought up a good point before, and that was there we go. So uh, Amelia was asking me about if I should have used a fixative and the answer is yes if I didn't want the walnut ink to move. But because I had made this painting in stages I kind of forgot that I actually had something water soluble in there. So if you are using something water soluble um, or pan pastels or, or soft pastels or anything like that that's going to move then once you put the uh, varnish on it because it's like dumping a bucket of water on top, right? So it's water soluble, it's going to move. Um, then a spray fixative would have been a super easy um, alternative. But because I didn't think that far ahead, now I have a few areas to fix up, but that's okay because I don't mind. What I'm doing is I'm going back in with a bit of paint and like I said, you could use any paint you want because it's water soluble. I can go back in with uh, chalk paints, acrylic paints. It's all good. And I'm not painting out the whole painting again. I'm just brightening up some of the areas that got a little dingy because my walnut ink, which is brown, moved. And there we go. 
and it's just kind of sitting on the surface, which is fine. That's all, exactly what I wanted. And then, whoops, didn't mean to pick up that blue, but that's okay. There we go. And some more white, again, where it's looking dingy. Then I'm gonna let that dry before we get into the next step of the faux encaustic. Um, while I'm, I'm painting this out, I'm gonna to talk to you guys a little bit about um, the membership. Our membership is growing quite quickly. And because of that, I'm finding it really difficult um, to record videos, um, to, to begin a membership, to answer questions and all that stuff. So it's not that I'm ignoring you guys, it's just that I really am finding it hard to manage my time. Um, so apologies if I'm not getting back to your answers right away, um, but do post them not in the feed because I'm not looking at the feed so much anymore. Make sure you only communicate to me through the um, through our, our membership. So don't forget, our group is called um, Open Studio with Christina, and very soon um, there is going to be another membership, and the membership is going to be a paid membership. That's um, part of my my announcement for the classes. So rather than doing individual classes, I've been spending a lot of time looking at different platforms and things like that. It seems to me that my best way of teaching is very much um, uh, webinar style, right? So. I'm finding that an active membership where I'm actually in there working with you is going to be better for me than pre-recorded um, videos that I just sell you and then eventually they become out of date and you can't communicate with me and then you ask me questions months later and I have or years later and I have no idea what we're talking about. So I've decided to go with an active membership which is just where we're all doing what we're doing now. We're just working together. So that is coming up. Um, but for now, until I get to that point, um, what I really, and it's not going to be expensive, I just want it to be, um, like, obviously more affordable than, than going out and joining a class or anything like that, um, but it, it will, it will be a lot more, um, easy to communicate with me and get questions answered and things like that, so. I just wanted to bring that up. So if you're asking questions now, if you're asking in Messenger, unfortunately I just don't have a lot of time at this point to hop back over into um, in the Messenger and answer all your questions. So it's, like I said, it's not that I don't want to answer your questions, it's just that I'm, I'm finding it really difficult managing my time right now. So, but if you do ask a question, if you do it in the within the um, the group, the open studio group, then if I can't answer and somebody else knows the answer to that question because you have more experience or whatever, then please hop in and and help these people out. We have a lot of people that are quite new or just getting back into this or they've never really taken workshops with me before. So I always say that if you um, if you take thirty different art workshops on the same topic with 30 different teachers, you will end up learning 30 different techniques. Um, it's just the nature of the beast. We all do things our own way. We all do things very differently. And that's what I want you to take away from, I've got way too much blue in this brush. Uh, that's what I want you to take away from this membership and this uh, group that we formed is that um, ask your questions and within that forum, not in the feed because we're getting rid of the feed right as of Monday. Um, I won't be communicating through the feed anymore just because I'm losing track of everybody and I don't want to do that. So hop on over into the, the uh, group, fire your questions away there. If I happen to pop on and see your questions, then I will answer them. But once I start the membership, I have a, a solution to that, that um, once a week or whatever we'll do, is that you'll ask me questions and then I'll do like a live question and answer. 
to all the questions that have been submitted that week. So that way everybody gets their questions. But if there is something, you know, you're in the middle of a project and you're like, ah, this thing just happened. What do I do? How do I deal with this? Then that's what your group is for, right? That's what we're trying to establish by having a, a group is that it's, it's a bunch of like-minded people that can help one another. So, and some of you have taken a lot more courses than others. A lot of you absorb information differently and I just happen to be a materials person. I've always, always, always been fascinated by art materials. So I understand the properties of materials really well. But one thing I have learned from teaching over the past 15 years is that not everybody learns the same things or the same way. So a lot of you have to make notes or buy the product and try it and see if it works for you. Whereas for me, properties of art supplies, I'm gonna move this so that you guys can see what I'm doing. Properties of art supplies just seem to come to me um, second nature. So I don't struggle to learn properties, but there's so many other things like um, within art that I struggle with and because I don't have the skill set built up for it I have to learn and practice and everything else and that's going to be the basis for my my open studio membership is that We're going to carve out that time and whether you can do it live or whether you can do it on your own time because the world will go back to normal at some point or new normal as we're all calling it and Schedules may be different and people may have to go back to work and all that sort of stuff. So Given that that is probably a reality for some people then live may not be the um, Best thing for everyone. So That goes back to the reason I started this open studio in the first place is just because I knew that I needed um, to get into my art when this when the sky started to fall and um, I knew that I would have much more success at having a, at not having a mental breakdown, best way to put it, um, if I had community. So I figured that if I needed community, that so many of you needed community, and that's why I started this open studio, was less instructional but more that we could be painting together and then it has evolved evolved into um, what I'm realizing and there's nothing wrong with that um, it has evolved into people just wanting a bit more wanting some more information wanting some tutorials um, and that's why I'm shifting the way I'm teaching a little bit because I'm just adapting so we're all adapting to our new norm to whatever's going on for you guys um, and I'm just adapting in that when I do teach in person it will be it will be um, because it, it's for me as well I want to travel I want to see places I want to hang out with all you guys but at the same time, I recognize that people need more. People need a bit more open studio. We need more community when we're painting. When you're in a class, everybody's always thrilled that they're in the class and um, growing and thriving and painting and having fun. And then you go home and it's a bit of a lunch bag letdown because now you're on your own. So that's the reason that um, I'm continuing or I'm, I'm engaging now in more of an online presence because I'm realizing that it's not only something that I need, but I recognize the fact that everybody needs it. We all need community. None of us are islands, even though we think sometimes we are. Okay, so I think I've cleaned up the mess of this painting and what that meant was that I had smudged around a bit of that um, Thanks, Heather. I had smudged around a bit of uh, the the um, walnutting, sorry, because it was water soluble and I didn't intend to do that. And so I'm just going to need it to dry a little bit now because I just had to um, brighten up some of those areas that 
weren't as attractive as I thought they were the other day before I started messing it all up. So there is still some smudgy areas of the brown, but I actually think it lends to the overall effect. So I'm not going to like there's some wonky uh, puddling and stuff that happened in here, but that's okay. I'm really, I'm not bothered by that at all. It was just to have a little bit of the contrast bumped up so that it could look good. So, um, so that's all I did. Just bump up the contrast a little bit. I'm really liking this piece. Now you can see it's super, super shiny. If you wanted it to be perfect faux encaustic, then what you would do is you would go back in once this is dry and then you would varnish all the little spots that I just cleaned up. I'm not going to bother with that. What I'm going to do instead is I'm just going to let this dry and then we're going to get into part two of the faux encaustic. So for those of you just tuning back in, I'll get back to this piece. This is the piece that we made in the class um, in our project last Friday. And I did the full cost. I got it. It's really hard to see on the camera, but you can see there's just a very subtle um, sheen to it. But basically, I just poured on the acrylic, the varnish, really, really thick. And then I did the step two, which is the wax. So I'm going to do this after this dries. And for now, I'm going to move the camera down and we're going to talk about tomorrow's project. Yay! So, what I have, I'm going to move this, so I hope none of you get seasick because this is not exactly ideal. My tripod hasn't come in yet, so um, there. Okay, so I am running out of panels, as you can see. So, I have gone into my garage and found a piece of plywood. So, this is a really thin plywood, so I'm going to have to get creative with the framing afterwards if this piece turns out. Um, but I wanted to uh, introduce the project for tomorrow. It's really kind of interesting to me because um, um, one person uh, in our group, Diane Kaminsky, uh, check out her piece. She just posted it, I think, this morning or last night or something like that. And it's really cool because it was exactly the topic what we're going for. So I really want to um, work with the notion of building backgrounds so um so backgrounds to me are like i don't know i could do backgrounds a million different ways and we could have a membership which is just backgrounds because i build my backgrounds first this is how i paint hi diane um so i build my backgrounds first and then i seat my my um, object or my subject matter so I usually go on and on and on in backgrounds first and I play with them and then for any of you guys who've been tuned in since the beginning we started this open studio over three weeks ago now and you can see in all my paintings that come easiest to me it's when I've built the background first and then um, so for instance in the first one that I did I had a, um, a moose I can't even bring it. Oh, I could go get it. But um, anyway, I had a moose in there, or not a moose, an elk, sorry. And I didn't glue it in until afterwards. And then what I did, and that's exactly the sound they make, Pam. <laughs> My husband and I always try to mimic the sound um, just because I just thought that they're, they're, the elk cry was just so... I don't know. I thought it was hauntingly beautiful and everybody else was so annoyed by it in the campground that we were in in Jasper, but I just thought it was beautiful. Anyway, that aside, um, I wanted to put this elk in this painting, but I kept working on the background, working on the background, and then finally it just, when I went to put the elk in, something funny had happened. I was live and my paper that I had cut out, the elk that I had cut out glued to the table. So I couldn't peel, peel it off, and so I thought, huh. So instead of going out and finding another picture of another elk and cutting it out, I took that as a sign that there wasn't supposed to be an elk in that painting. And it turned out that that was the one, um, I'll go grab it. probably the easiest way just to show you something rather than 
So I'm going to lift the camera for a moment and then hold up the so can talk about it. All right. So this is the one that I had an elk. He was kind of like wandering through the bottom here or on this side, I think. And then in the end, when it glued to the table, I took that as a sign that this painting wasn't supposed to have an elk going through it. And I wound up that this little chickadee was having a little, um, I don't know, rendezvous with this little chickadee down here. So, and then the branches came afterwards and things like that. So, um, I'm, I, I listen to my paintings and, but if I don't start with a really, um, for me, a really textured, really worked on background, then I don't know what the painting is about. Like I don't know how to seat my object. So that gets me to my, my uh, project for tomorrow. So I want to teach you guys another background technique. Um, because so far all I've ever talked about is kind of like my easiest ways of doing things. Now I'm going to tilt this back down again. Um, my easiest ways of doing things. And that's that I always start with um, collage and then paint and scratching and that sort of thing. So that's all, all I've ever talked about to this point. So I want to be able to, let me turn this so we can see one another. Um, I want to be able to talk to you about different ways of approaching a background. It's not like I do things the exact same way. So in, in Diane's um, painting, what is illustrated beautifully is you can see in her painting she's got sections, right? She's got that area of the orange and the white collage and then she's got she's got areas of blocking and how so I've only showed you one technique that I've done before which is the scratches and then I pick out my areas to color block but a lot of that for me is intuitive because I've been doing that technique for so long like I've just developed it over time so I'm going to show you another background tomorrow but then I thought the fun in to me like we could just build backgrounds forever but they seem a little boring until we animate them. So when we breathe life into them is when I believe is when we give them a character, a person, an animal, a tree branch, any type of a surface item that breathes life into that painting. So it's not saying that abstract painting, if there's anything wrong with it, we're just not going for that. If you're comfortable just doing backgrounds and all that, then do backgrounds forever but for the project I decided that um, we would animate our project tomorrow with so we'll make a background a different way than we've normally made backgrounds and that we would animate it using people so you can see I've got these little cut out people here so you don't have to use all these people you can just choose a person and you can see in Diane's, she has a person in the orange part. So something relatable within the abstract, absolutely. So we're animating it, we're breathing life into the painting. Um, so I'm just going to pick one, or have you pick one thing right now that you want to animate your, um, your background with, but the focus will be on the background, right? It's just learning to, to animated to breathe life into it to um, make it tell a story so Pam Oliver is another um, painting you should check out from last week I'm loving her story because her painting is actually turned into a story meaning she keeps working on it and the story keeps evolving so if you go back and check out um, Pamela Oliver's um, painting I actually am getting such a kick out of it especially the title of it I don't know if she's posted that but she texted it to me and it's hilarious um, so yeah so I, I love that that a story came from the two little characters that have animated the um, thing so these people are all fine and dandy I wanted to show you what a cutout person looks like a cutout person generally is not missing half a body so that's why when you're choosing your image you want to choose something where the person is not cut off unless you purposely want to do something with you know with that 
So that being said, try to find um, an image of a person. And if you go on Pinterest, you can look up cutout people and you can find all kinds of people. You can find people falling, people flying, people diving, people, whatever you want. You can find people, um, color, black and white, do whatever you want. You can find a person. But, um, so you see, like if I had this as a background, and then I put, let me get something bigger so you can actually see it. And then I put this person in here, right? It's actually more interesting already. And then I could take, make this even more interesting and take a piece of paper and put it, maybe that's a little big for this demonstration. I could put it over here and then you see what happens when I put him in here. Now all of a sudden I'm starting to create a composition and all I did was lay down three pieces of paper. Okay, so that's what we're going to be doing with our backgrounds tomorrow is we're going to be, um, we're going to be uh, working with a, a background as our focus, which will be a new technique um, that I want to show you how to create composition, but then if you want to take it one step further, you'll animate it with a person, an animal, um, an object. It doesn't even need to be a person. If you look at Tracy Lloyd's, um, sorry, Tracy Lynch, <laughs> I knew her before she was married. If you look at Tracy Lynch's um, painting, she did the ice cream cone and it's great. So it doesn't have to be a person, but you can see like that ice cream cone it looks so great in that painting and it is the subject matter of that painting and if it completely animates the um, the background so even though our focus is going to be background right learning to create composition um, we're going to animate it with a person and so for that reason I have chosen uh, one of my favorite pictures and this was um, my youngest son Sebastian on his first day of school so it's kind of a weird picture because obviously someone, my husband maybe took it, um, standing. So he looks very foreshortened, but that's okay. It doesn't matter. He was a short person and that's the picture. So that's what I'm going to work with. It's, I'm using this picture because it's, it's a complete image, right? It's got whole body and that sort of thing. And learning to animate your, um, your compositions, your abstract paintings, is really interesting because a lot of it will come from the position of the uh, subject matter. So, or like how he's walking or like that ice cream cone that Tracy had that looked perfect. Like it was before it was all drippy and that sort of thing. So if you have a photo you wanna work with, great. If not, go ahead and print something off. Um, but the position of the person, the body motion or the whatever will spark the idea. Um, I just got, I, 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 when I started looking on Pinterest, I got into a bit of a rabbit hole of looking at, at different painters and different artists who use um, people, I guess, as their subject matter. And I loved the way that they were all being incorporated. Most of them were in, in very graphic um, not not bad graphic but like more like graphic artistry so um, they would be uh, either advertisements or something like that um, but we're gonna make them more fine art and seat the the people so when I'm looking at this I'll turn the board because I'm thinking that my board which obviously already has some paint on it um, I keep looking at this and I'm like it's if I had like a little short person, let me show you up here, I could seat them on the line and then this would be a really interesting painting or one like this. Let's try this one. I can show you, there we go. So you can see it. You can see like I have this big vast expanse of a painting and then this one little person which gives it life. And what's that person doing, right? So. In the the photo, I'll make it come closer to you. So in that photo, that woman is doing really nothing. But if I put her up here, and now I could put a little bus stop sign beside her, 
or I could, you know, I could do almost anything because now that she is seated within my, my composition, I can now create the story behind it. So, and it could just be that she's just standing there. Like it could be nothing of any significance. Um, but because of the size of my board, and the reason I'm working with a big board is um, because I really want you to be able to see how composition can come together pretty quickly um, using the size of your paper. So in our third project, I think, when I worked on the moose, I was talking about going, um, hi Jen, you can review this, watch it later on. Um, lots of information, but this is about the project for tomorrow. So I'm going to use this one and you can see that obviously this line up here, this horizon, might not be good because of the size of the object, but I could always flip it and you see I could put him down here on, on the road, right? And then have all this great space above to create the rest of my painting. So for tomorrow, um, you don't need anything different than what you had last week. So lots of papers um, for collage. So I've gone ahead and made myself a pile of paper. I'm going to show you different types of paper collage because I've been reviewing it only in my, um, in the open studio, but just to go over it. So this is like a wallpaper. So it's a medium weight. This is just a photocopy print off my printer and it doesn't matter if it's um, laser or if it's um, inkjet, if you're gonna be doing collage. There's tissue paper, there's a napkin, um, book paper, more napkins, more napkins, more paper. Um, and then here is a piece of scrapbook paper. So you can see how rigid and tough these are. I'm gonna show you how to incorporate this as well. Um, so nothing different from, from last collage or from last uh, project. Same materials, just have a bunch of paper ready so that you can rip things up and create your collage. Your pieces of paper that you collage should be in direct proportion to the size of the board you're working on. So that being said, if I was working on a little six by six panel, I wouldn't need nearly the this size of paper, right? I might have a still little collection of paper, but if I'm going through my drawers and all I find that are little bits and pieces this big, this is fine because a six by six, we don't need to um, have big pieces of paper. So, but I'm going to do uh, this big piece, which like I said, is just a piece of um, scrap plywood that I found in our garage. And it's approximately two feet by two feet, I'm guessing, and 24 by 24-ish. So I need bigger pieces of paper because otherwise I will be here for three, four hours just trying to show you how to make a background. And I don't want these projects to be overwhelming. I want these projects to be super fun and a little takeaway um, that you can do. So what I will recommend is that for tomorrow, you try to work small again. So let me get the one from last week. So I'm gonna move all this stuff so it's not distracting. So this is the one from last week, right? And it's got the faux encaustic on it. And you can see this one was a 612 and it was doable in an hour. So um, I may have to have my hair dryer tomorrow. So if, if you guys want to add one thing to your, um, your repertoire of things is the hair dryer, because I'm working so large, it does need a bit more, um, it's going to require me to have it dry a little bit faster. So when I'm working small, it's okay because I can do the whole thing in an hour and then just let it dry. But if I am working larger then I'm, I might have a hair dryer on hand. So, um, same materials as last week. So let's go over that list. You'll need a substrate of some kind, right? A board, a panel, a canvas, a piece of paper. It doesn't matter if you're working on Bristol board. It really doesn't matter what you're working on. Um, so your substrate of choice and then um, paint. So I'll go over the list one more time of paints because there seems to be a lot of confusion around paints. Um, if you have chalk and clay based paints, um, go ahead and use them 
in conjunction with acrylics or separate from acrylics or whatever you want but then you should probably just consider the faux encaustic as a finish um, if you're mixing it with any type of acrylic or plastic if you are working strictly in encaustic uh, sorry in um, chalk and clay based paints things that don't have acrylic in them then you can transition it into an encaustic painting later so one of these days but this will be after this whole um, isolation thing we'll dive more into encaustic because right now people just don't have access to the materials so those of you who do it at home it's wonderful but for those of you who don't this gets kind of confusing when I talk about transitioning not transitioning so I'm going to do all my paintings in faux encaustic until um, the isolation period is over and then everybody has access to materials and things again so um, so I work with every type of paint that is available to me in my studio and that ranges from chalk and clay based paints to acrylics to tempera which is water soluble um, I work in uh, like with soft pastels I'll work with anything I have because my studio is filled with things that have colors and whatever and if I turn you know if I open a drawer and I see this beautiful chartreuse crayon looking at me I'm like ooh, that's a great color then I'll just pick it up and I'll just incorporate it I, it's not that often that I think um, okay what do I have in in chartreuse it's, it's usually not how that works for me um, I just grab whatever is handy and then if later on I decide I want to put wax on something then I would have to deal with that transition period if I have acrylic or something in there but for the purpose of the rest of these open studios we're just going to keep oil stick same thing um, we're just going to keep everything such that within the one hour we can have it ready to dry and then do full encaustic on so that means you can do anything if you are pouring um, if you are pouring your varnish for the faux, faux encaustic over top of things like oil pastels and stuff like that, then you're not going to smudge it. If you are using things that are water soluble, um, like I had the walnut ink and things like that, then it's best to use, um, like Amelia had suggested last week, after, well, or when it's drying, it's best to use a fixative, let it dry, and then do your faux encaustic on top. Okay? So I'm going to do that. So for tomorrow's project, like I said, you won't need anything special. You just need your paints in whatever colors you like, a pile of paper. Okay. So, and I'm just talking about collage paper that you like. Um, this is more background paper, but also it can have the colors and things you like because we are going to be working with um, a lot of these papers to create our um, composition so if we're working with papers to be in our composition you might not want to go ahead and choose things that aren't complementary to one another so if you look at my pile of paper here I have lots of colors I'll take that one out for now I have lots of colors but they all kind of go together right so I'm I'm not going to throw in too many monkey wrenches at this point and and give myself a um, harder task tomorrow of you know adjusting a color or changing a color I want this all to work so I'm picking things that I think will work together again I don't ever really have a plan for my art so I have no idea what's going to come of it but I know that I have um, I have a pretty good start here by everything um, having a nice complementary feel to it so, um, that being said, we said, okay, let's go over our materials again. We're going to need the substrate, right? A board or, or paper or canvas or whatever you want to work on. Pile of paper for collaging, pile of paints, some glue of some kind, right? So again, if you um, have access to some, some Mod Podge or some glue or some 
matte medium or some gloss medium or wallpaper paste, what have you. That's what you're going to need for tomorrow is because we need stuff to glue our papers down. And, um, and then you're going to need, if you want to, we're going to have one image that will be your your I can't find your piece she is referencing okay so you guys are dealing with that all right so um yeah so try to post everything guys um try to post everything within our our group because if you go to the open studio with Christina group then we can all find stuff a lot easier than in a regular general feed it just makes things so much easier so um, I should have shared it to that this morning. I apologize for not doing that, but Diane, if you want to pop on over and and post it into our um, our Open Studio with Christina uh, member group, it just makes life a lot easier for everybody to find everything, and then that way we're not scrolling and scrolling and hunting and searching, and because I don't know how all that works, and I do know I lose a lot of things. So one object, one element. Um, whether it's a person, an ice cream cone, an animal, it doesn't matter. But I would like for you to choose an object that is complete. Meaning, if you're going to choose a person, that they have legs and feet and all that stuff. Unless you choose to make that, that, that challenge um, interesting for you, right? So, if you have a half a person, how, or a half an ice cream cone, or a half of a dog, or a half of a something... What is the other half camouflaged behind that is like, like my hand, for instance, right? So if my hand were the object that was um, holding these people up, then that would be collaged right onto there. But you'll have to get creative with what your people or your person or your subject matter is doing. So I'm choosing something easy because I want to have a full demo done in an hour or approximately an hour tomorrow with you and so I need to um, cut this out and I'll probably do that today for ease of operation so I'm not keeping you waiting tomorrow and um, yeah and then just be prepared to dive right in tomorrow at noon and that's it for that project any more questions make sure you go into the right feed to do it right so do it within our member group so now I'm going to turn this camera around again. Pardon the crazy kitchen effect. So here we go. So now I'm going to show you the faux encaustic. So my chalk paint is dry and my acrylics are dry. The stuff that I went in ahead and um, touched up. Because like I said, it was looking just a little dirty from what I had done on um, by pouring and moving around the brown walnut ink. So now I'm going to use my beeswax polish. So we talked about this before, but any type of a furniture wax will do. This one I just happen to like, so I buy it all the time. You order this from Lee Valley. Um, it is called Clap Hams. And I'm saying it like ridiculously so that you can understand how it is spelt. It is C-L-A-P-H-A-M apostrophe S. Clap hams. Um, I'm sure that's not how the family would introduce you or themselves to you. But that is the name and I get this one from Lee Valley. But honestly use any, 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 any furniture wax if you can get your hands on some. If not, just wait till all this is over and then grab yourself some furniture polish. Where do you buy it? You can buy it anywhere that people refinish furniture, um, but also in a hardware store where they have the stains and everything. They have the varnishes and then they also have furniture wax. So just grab any furniture wax. Some of them are more smelly than others. Somebody asked me about the Annie Sloan. I like the Annie Sloan wax, except you should probably do it outside with good ventilation because it is super, super smelly. Um, and that's just because it's full of solvents. So solvents are things like paint thinners and stuff like that. And what they put that in there for is that once those things evaporate into the air, then your wax is dry, okay? So they do that as the process for, um, for it to dry. So I just like this one because it's not as smelly and I can do it inside. So now 
This one is really soft. Not all of them are as soft. If you have one that is um, not soft at all, then you can just use a paper towel or a rag like this here. I have a blue um, paper towel and you could go ahead and scoop it out with that and just rub it on. But basically I'm just gonna grab a brush and just smear it around first. I want a nice thick coat. So on top of my gloss varnish, it's super, super shiny, right? And now with the wax, I'm just taking out the shine and this is what's creating that faux wax look. So I'm just smearing it around first to make sure I have some everywhere and then I'm going to, to rub it all into the surface um, using my paper towel. So the areas I just painted are dry, so that will take care of those situations. Um, the, the wax will even out the sheen so that, because we're trying to knock down that gloss. That's the whole purpose of putting the, the polish on top. You guys have any questions? Um, do you suggest ordering online? Um, gosh, there's so many. I think any that you can get in a is best if you're just experimenting with them. I really like the um, clay-based paints. They're probably my new favorite. But then again, any of them, I, I mean, especially during this time, it's really hard to say what's available and what's not. If you have any place near you that sells, um, just Google uh, chalk paint or um, clay-based paint for furniture. They're generally sold as a furniture paint. So, there you go, because a lot of people are refurnishing their furniture and their cupboards and stuff like that. Okay, so what I've done is I've just distributed it around and now I'm just taking this cloth and I'm making sure that I rub it in to all the surfaces. I wanna take down that shine from the varnish. There we go. Now, the beauty of um, I can just leave it to dry. If I need to speed it up to dry, the best thing, and now we, we can't do it real time of year here where I live. Um, but on a sunny day, I throw the painting outside for like 10 minutes in the sun on my driveway and it's honestly, it does the best fusing you can possibly imagine. So what it does is it, it heats up the wax that you just applied, it self levels it, and then it fuses it and so it comes out like within five ten minutes depending on how sunny it is it comes out perfectly dry and when i say dry like looking like an encaustic painting because right now it's very very wet so it's still very shiny so that's all i need to do for that um i could Fuse it a little bit with a heat gun. If I wanted to, I'm going to apply another layer of wax to this one. Just because I did one the other day, but why not? There we go. I'll let that one fuse as well. And that is really all there is to the faux encaustic. So um, later on, we will talk about um, when you're doing faux encaustic. I'm not on a canvas, I wouldn't do this but on one on a panel. If you wanted to continue to do more patinas and stuff, that is possible on this one, but not on the canvas. So we won't get into that today. Um, once you've applied your wax, you're pretty much done. Meaning that you can't really go ahead at this point. Say hi to you guys. Um, you can't really go ahead and start doing too many other things to it because the wax is is it's like sealing it, right? Like waterproofing it. So you didn't you wouldn't go back in and start collaging things onto it and all that. You're just creating more work for yourself. So I always suggest don't don't do any wax on your painting until you love it. Like until it's almost 
um, perfect. Like it's, it goes beyond icing on the cake. It's like sprinkles on the cake. It's, it's, it's really the end. Uh, American Paint Company. Love this paint. Has nothing to do, nothing in it but clay and natural ingredients. That's great. So that's a, a great suggestion. So, um, like I said, I'm not really fussy about paint brands and things like that because, um, can you show it and what you did to fix it? Okay, let me grab the walnut ink. So walnut ink, I don't know if you can get this anymore. I sell this because I went and bought it all up before I um, realized that it was becoming obsolete. So it's actually just ground walnut shells and then they've been toasted or roasted or whatever it is. So, um, so that they really have a really dark color to them. And then all we do for this purpose is this is a dry, like a powder, crystals almost, just broken up shells. And so you just dissolve a half a teaspoon of this into, um, oh, it says right on the back, dissolve one level teaspoon in a half a cup of hot water. And that'll make a two point something percent solution, two and a half. So you can dilute if, um, if needed for lighter shades. So I never want to measure, I just kind of throw it all in. But when you put it in a spray bottle, um, this will last you a very long time these little things what I use it for is you know when I'm I'm scratching and I'm gouging and all that kind of thing I use this to stain my grooves a lot so black is is harsh walnut ink is sort of natural so um, I use it a lot and then so in my big vat of goo that I'm always using that um, that that uh, juice jug that I have it always has about a teaspoon of this into it um, yes I do have lots of walnut ink for sale crystals and um, we can definitely do a porch pickup for that or if anybody needs it mailed it is $7.99 Canadian for those who are watching um, from our American friends it's a good deal for you guys um, $7.99 Canadian and then um, I'll just have to pop it in the mail so I don't think it would be that much to you know what I could even take it out of its cute little jar if it's gonna cost too much to do it that way and I would just put it in a baggie for you guys with the instructions on there and then you can just transfer it into something else so if anybody wants that we can pop that in the mail it shouldn't cost very much to uh, put that in an envelope um, and of course for anybody in town we have porch pickup either at the store or at the studio and that's about it um okay so walnut ink and then how do you apply it so in my big vat of goo so like i said I, you can make a spray bottle and then you can do that wax for sale i am desperate for wax too so <laughs> that one is really tricky i've written to my supplier many many times but i think they might be shut down so wax really tough right now which is why we're not working with a lot of wax these days um but yeah, I'll let you know if I get my hands on any Margo. Um, walnut ink, so my big vat of goo is just what I clean my brushes in, but it always starts with some water and some walnut ink. And then I'll clean my, my paint brushes in there and it just deepens that brown, whatever. So I'm, this is always a major component in my, in my stain, okay? Um, and you want to know how you put an order in. Um, I, I'll get this up on my website actually today. Yeah, I'll pop this on my website today. And then what I'll do is I'll put the link to it in um, on Facebook in our group, okay? So you can check for it on the group and that'll be easy because that's an easy ad for me. Um, so I'll do that one for you guys. And like I said, so anybody who wants this mailed, I'll just pour it out of the bottle into a baggie and with the instructions on it uh, because it'll be a lot cheaper to send it in an envelope. All right, so I think that's it for this project. So tomorrow, kids, we are doing another project. Looking so forward to it because I love to see what everybody's been doing. It's been awesome. Um, tomorrow we're working on creating a background through composition. So the composition is coming to us. So I've shown you 
one way of creating composition before, right, is just by um, maybe bottle in case Canada Post has an issue shipping powder through the mail. Mm. No, because I can make it, I'll, I'll put it in a, in a baggie with the labels and stuff on it because I mean, it doesn't need the, so this is my experience. So let me tell you about a little bit about shipping. So as soon as I ship those prints for my uh, fundraiser and um, the printer gave us a great deal, everybody kept giving us a great deal, everything was great until I got to Canada Post and I had to ship five, I think, prints and they were each over $20 to ship. And so I thought, well, that's crazy. I'm going to put them in a tube. So I put them in a tube, which is just like a little thing like this, right? So they were in a tube and it didn't matter the size of the tube. It cost me $24 to ship them. So I'm, I'm just, as soon as the Canada Post recognizes anything that's not flat, they, they consider it a, a parcel. And small parcel, big parcel, it doesn't matter. Parcels are really expensive. So I'll put it in a baggie and I'll make a little photocopy. I might even just soak the label off and then put it on. Don't worry, I'll have it looking like that's the original packaging, that's how it comes. And no one um, will be concerned. It's also, it, it's, it's not really a powder, it's, yeah. It will be named and labeled and properly, that sort of thing. So not to worry, that's how I'll ship it if anybody does want this. Um, and I think that's about it. So project tomorrow you don't need anything special you just need some glue some paper subject matter if you want it which is like I said in let me grab this a com if you're gonna do a person a complete person or be prepared to do something creative with half bodies um, another image would be like a like an animal or a bird or something right something that you could um, Okay, Heather said, I'll rephrase, you had used walnut ink on the big picture, then you pour the varnish. You mentioned, there's more. I can't see more. Um, hmm. Okay, so yes, I had walnut ink on here. I'm not, I, I can't read the rest of the text because it's, it's only allowing me to read the one sentence but I had walnut ink on here from my very first layer and my very first layer and my second layer, my third layer, I kind of, I just did backgrounds for a few weeks just to get something down and then I decided to make paintings out of them. So when I, when I got to actually working on this one, I had forgotten that I had walnut ink on there and walnut ink is water soluble. Um, so, yeah, so that's that's all. So I could have like if if I really don't remember what I've done to something, then the best practice would be just to put a fixative on it. Um, so Tess is asking what size ratio of photo to the entire piece. That's going to be up to you guys. So, like I said, I'm going to turn this back, and we'll talk a little bit more about that because it's a great question. It comes up all the time um, when I'm when I'm teaching so let's just look at that so let me move this and then I'm going to turn okay so this board um, is one that I found in my garage and it's just because I'm running out of panels so this board as you can see it's already got some some my husband pulls things apart all the time so this obviously had paint on it from something else this is where a shelf was or something was glued on here it's a natural wood and then there's this other bit of paint on here so we'll use this already as a composition because maybe that's the composition you want is that you're creating a horizon so I had flipped it over to illustrate the point that like this is a pretty big board it's a 24 24 but if all I had was a person that was this big and you see how big my hand is right so that's like the size of a finger if I were to put her up here on the horizon right maybe I'll move here over here for a bit of composition then that little person is telling the whole story so 
in relation to the size of this board, she is minuscule, but let me grab a smaller board. Okay, so let's even seat her here. If I put her here, you can see she's telling a different story, right? So the idea of the image is only going to be how you want to how you want this to tell the story of your painting. So that's probably the best place to see her in here or down here. No, that's probably the best place. So if you were to put her here, she's telling a different story, right? And if I were to seat her up here, then she's telling a completely different story because she's on this horizon line. So the picture that I have chosen to use is much bigger than my finger, right? Like it's a, it's a much bigger picture. So I'm gonna cut him out. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip this and I'm gonna show you that once I put him down here on this horizon, it changes the story again. So, or I could turn the panel this way and then have him intersecting that line and it's telling a different story. So, but if I were to have this board all as one piece and I were to just put this right in the middle, you can see that she's just totally floating. So if she's just up here floating without having that line for composition, then it's not gonna make any sense. So we're gonna talk about that more when you get tomorrow, when we get to tomorrow's project, is that the, the subject matter whatever the subject matter is doing and also the size of the subject matter is going to influence how you seat them within your work because i'm not just going to have you make a big background and then randomly float a person or an ice cream cone or a bird or whatever it is in the middle that's why when i did that other first one the bird i had to put the branches in because just two birds just randomly floating around it seemed a little strange especially when they had their claws out they weren't in flight um, so that's why I had to put the branches through the painting. So the, the image that you choose is going to, um, based on the size, based on whatever you want, is going to be integrated tomorrow. So that's going to be part of tomorrow's lesson. And again, I'm, I'm encouraging you to work small so that you can get the concept down. So um, if you work really large, then if this is new to you, it becomes too much, too, too uh, biting off more than you can chew at one time, and then you won't be able to follow along. I want you to be able to follow along and create composition. So um, composition in your painting gets harder and harder, the larger and larger the surface gets. Okay, I'm gonna move that back. And um, so remember guys, any questions or anything you have, make sure you put them in the a group in the open studio with Christina group. It's just much easier for everyone to follow along, to see your images, to see your questions. And then by all means, if you have answers or suggestions or whatever, hop on and definitely go ahead and answer because I don't always have time to check that out. So without further ado, we will see everybody tomorrow and just basic supplies. That's all you need, glue, paint, collage, and a substrate. That's really it. So, um, like I said, during this open studio, during this isolation time, we're working with what we've got. So don't get out and fuss about, you know, having the right thing and the wrong thing or whatever. That's why my lovely panels are getting more and more um, challenging all the time because I'm just pulling things out of the, um, out of the garage at this point. So um, that's it. So we'll see everybody tomorrow. Project number two. Bye.